Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, nice to see you here. My name is Anna Lindberg, and um, I'm the director of SASNET, the Swedish South Asian Studies Network at Lund University. And um, it's a great pleasure today to have those um, the speakers that we have here, Professor uh, John Miller and uh, also Helena Turfi, or Helena okay. Turfi, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, before I introduce you, I would just like to ask you to be kind enough and write your name on this list. And um, if you don't know anything about SASNET, please take a brochure. And if you know something about SASNET, you might still need it, <laughs> please. And um, feel very welcome to um, this seminar today and also to our open seminars that we will have in the future. Keep track of them, them uh, um, at our web page. That is um, Lars Eklund, who is sitting there. He is the webmaster and he updates the web page every day and you will find a lot of useful information there about research and education and other things about South Asia. Uh, so, Doug Miller is a leading expert on workers' uh, rights in the fashion business. Uh, professor uh, from the School of Design at University of Northumbria. Yeah. Northumbria. <laughs> yeah. uh, very welcome here. We are very uh, uh, eager to listen more to you and also to hear a little bit more of, uh, about you from Helena Tolfin. Helena, who is a Swedish writer, now working at um, uh, communications, uh, now she's a communications manager at, for the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and um, uh, Humanitarian Law at Lund University. And um, she has worked as a journalist and a social analyst for Save the Children and for SIDA, the Swedish International Development Corporation uh, Agency in Bangladesh. And last year she wrote a book uh, in Swedish, um, Innan Floden Taros, Sisters by the River, um, which was um, a very, or is a very fascinating book and, uh, about um, life in uh, Bangladesh among textile workers. So very welcome Helena and also Professor Dr. Nilla. Very welcome. <laughs> Uh, well, with that introduction, I mean, now you already know who we are, but I could just say that it was fascinating for me uh, having uh, lived three years in Bangladesh and actually been present in Bangladesh when the Spectrum factory collapsed uh, to read about the repercussions and the work that has been going on behind the scenes that I didn't have a clue about, which is basically what your book is about. Um, uh, I, my, my book was more about the general scene in Bangladesh, but it did feature uh, a factory collapse. And I, in the spring, after this happened, in Sweden, in the little duck pond Sweden, everyone phoned me and said, how could, it, how could you know that this happened? How could you feature it in your book before it happened? And the sad answer to that question is because it happened three times while I lived in Bangladesh, and one of them were the spectrum disaster. But I, I leave the floor to you, Doug, and then I'll come back to you in... When you okay. done your bit. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Helena. I, um, I'll say a little bit more about myself. Um, I spent eight years seconded from my university to the Global Union in the textile industry, where I was uh, research director. Uh, my job was to try and map supply chains, see where the networks were of trade unionists who could come together. Uh, and hopefully negotiate um, what, what, what have been called international framework agreements on worker rights um, with major multinationals. Um, in 2008, that, the money that was funding my post came dried up and I had to return to the university, by which time, uh, largely as a result of the uh, spectrum uh, collapse, the, uh, the Spanish company Inditex and the general secretary of uh, the global union I was working for had kind of come together to work on a compensation scheme for the victims of this uh, disaster. And that led in turn to the first international framework agreement in the sector. And one of the um, things to emerge from that relationship 
uh, largely, uh, I have to say, inspired by me because I, I was looking at going back to the university and having to teach classical sociological theory to first years after eight years doing quite practical work in the clothing industry and I thought, no, I'm, I'm, this isn't happening. Uh, so we created a post in the fashion department uh, and so for four years between 2008 and 2012 I, I, I've kind of been working with fashion students. Um, in this whole area of, uh, if you like, worker rights and fashion. Retired last year, uh, retired being uh, in, in inverted commas because I'm currently uh, uh, advising, uh, back again, advising the Global Union in relation to this horrible disaster that's occurred uh, at Rana, Rana Plaza. So uh, what I thought I'd do for maybe 15, 20 minutes is just give you a brief background of the industry in Bangladesh, and particularly its position in the global value chain. Uh, and uh, some of you may or may not be familiar, does that mean anything? So I know for some people it won't mean anything, but it might mean something for some of the sociologists here maybe. And th there's a concept that uh, is very related to uh, value chain theory, and it's called buyer-driven value chains, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, because it's very relevant to what we're talking about. And then, uh, in, in particular, the, um, each, each country, each national textile and clothing industry uh, has to try and find its way on a path of uh, upward growth and engage in what, what's called economic upgrading and it's interesting to kind of explore what, what that means, particularly in relation to Bangladesh. That gets us, I think, into the health and safety record in the country and then we'll talk, maybe, maybe we'll look at these in stages as, as we get into what I hope will be a conversation and please, two things. I come from the north of England. That might not be a problem for you in terms of my uh, accent. If it is, just wave your hand and say, sorry, I did not understand what you said there, and I will try and explain or slow my speech down. Um, and secondly, there may be some technical uh, words or concepts used that you're not, you, know, you don't quite understand. So again, just wave and uh, tell me, and I'll, I'll try my best to explain. Right, this helps me, for me anyway, to try and understand the industry that we're dealing with by looking at the different columns uh, uh, in, in what's, what's called the value chain. Actually, it's a commodity chain, and we'll talk about value in, in a moment. So there are various sub-industries, if you like, that are involved in um, taking raw materials, and we're talking about cotton, we're talking about uh, oil, because... Uh, Petroleum uh, products are used to make uh, such things as polyester, uh, which have to be processed into uh, fabric. Uh, and that fabric finds its way into the assembly part of the industry, where, where actually the garments are made. And that's where, let's be honest, most of the attention is placed, the old sweatshop problem. Although, of course, there are things we could look at, and indeed we do look at, in the whole fair trade movement, uh, back down... Uh, back down the chain, or, or we should really say back up the train. We, this is upstream, that's downstream, the nearer you get to the market. Um, then uh, from the assembly part of the chain, you have these export networks. Now, uh, Bangladesh is a case in point here. Um, it, it, it is full of what we might call trading companies, buying houses, supply chain management companies. There are some big multinationals that will um, say to a retailer, you uh, have an, uh, an, an interesting kind of design you want to bring to market, let us find the factories where you can get that manufactured and we will do the rest. We will see to it that it will get to the market. Um, and, and the marketplace exists, uh, of course, of uh, the big retailers. Uh, and we know that uh, our own, you know, your own high street has some, some big names on it, but increasingly, and I suspect it might be uh, a feature here as well, I know back in the UK, the big supermarkets have now got their own clothing ranges, and they've tried to kind of muscle in at the value end of what we would call the, the, the marketplace uh, in terms of um, uh, fashion. And of course, the whole thing is linked by logistics, okay? Uh, and if you, if you kind of want to follow this up, the, 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 guy, the guy to kind of have a look at his readings is Gary Jureffi. Um, now, that, that, the work he did was on trying to map out the, what we call, global commodity chain, and he was looking at different, different uh, products. 
Um, and subsequently, work has been done on what's called the value chain. And again, maybe the best way to try and describe this is if you take the price of a garment and you slice it up in terms of who gets what, uh, roughly that curve is an attempt to try and show you uh, across this global industry uh, 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 or across the parts of the industry where the real value is. In other words, who's making the most money? Right? And the most money is obviously being made at the retail end. Uh, and, but, and the brand owners, the, the rent they take off, and the least money is being made at the bottom end, uh, particularly in assembly. Uh, and, and that's a whole other kind of lecture uh, we, could, we could do. It's fair to say, and we have, we have to say this, that, that fabric, if you look at the manufacturing cost, uh, when there's a kind of price negotiation about a garment, the most expensive part, the, most, the, the, the highest value part of the, the cost is the fabric not the labour, the fabric, and that's kind of true for, for most garments. All right, now some key facts about Bangladesh for you. Um, initially, when Bangladesh uh, started off on this path of uh, development through manufacturing, uh, as indeed a number of other countries have done that never had a tradition in this industry, and that's probably, that's not true of Bangladesh as formerly as part of, part of uh, India. Uh, but when... Uh, when the industry uh, started, it was very much what, what, what you would call a CMT country, and there are a number of these. And what CMT means is cut, make, and trim, where the fabric comes in, into the factory, or it's into the country, into the factory. Uh, it will be cut out into bundles. What they, you know, they lay the cloth in great big piles. Uh, you have a cutter with a, it's almost like a band saw that cuts out the pattern. And then that's moved on down the assembly line, stitched together, uh, cut the threads, bang, you have a garment. Very simple. Of course, it's much more complex than that, but that's, that's what a number of uh, 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 ex, uh, clothing uh, uh, industries, in, particularly in LDCs, look like. Um, and of course, export processing zones were the place where a lot of this uh, development took place. Now. Um, in the terms of uh, Bangladesh, the concentration of the industry largely in Greater Dhaka and in Chittagong, which is the port where the, all the garments are exported from, uh, has resulted in uh, an influx very much like our own industrial revolutions of uh, movement of workers from the countryside into the, uh, into the cities, into the, uh, into the build up areas, where of course the factories have been, uh, been built. Initially, factories, by the way, built on uh, just occupying a floor in sometimes in a, in a, in a residential building. Uh, it's latterly there's been massive expansion out into the um, uh, environs of uh, Greater Dhaka, largely because the property prices uh, in, in Dhaka have kind, kind of gone through have gone through the roof. So we have a high proportion of women. Uh, we have a high proportion of young women and most of them, most of whom are, if you like, sending money back to the village every month. Okay, have extended families uh, that rely on them to uh, to uh, uh, send send their part of their wage back home. We have one of the lowest wage rates globally. I think probably uh, Myanmar and uh, Laos would be two countries where the wages are probably at the same level or, or less. And we have excessive working hours, and this is uh, kind of a major, major problem. Now, I'll just, uh, we had a, a documentary in the UK not a week ago, Panorama is our kind of investigative program. And they went, uh, they went to Bangladesh and they filmed uh, a couple of factories, but one in particular was making for the German uh, value retailer Lidl. I don't know if you have a Lidl here in Sweden, yeah, maybe, yeah, they, they certainly do in Copenhagen. Um, now, this factory, they, they set the camera up in a, in a, opposite the factory and they watched the workers go in at 7 o'clock in the morning and then watched them come out 4 o'clock the next day, right in the middle of the night. And also, they watched the uh, security guard who went to exercise himself actually lock the factory gate, the, lock the door. And that's relevant because, it, as we'll find, that's why I've used the term forced to die in a number of instances, right? we'll find out later on, uh, the, the workers were either told to go back in or could not physically get out of the factory. 
and many workers end up getting uh, killed in a stampede rather than actually, um, you know, burnt, burnt alive. Um, and I was annoyed at this documentary. I'll tell you why I was annoyed at this documentary. Because they kind of stopped it. It almost said, well, the problems with management in Bangladesh, and maybe even the workers in Bangladesh, because they're prepared to work all these long hours. What they wasn't doing was saying, why are the workers, why is that factory operating until 4 o'clock in the morning? to get these kind of uh, production targets in. And that's something we need to unpack. There's a large number of factories, and there's a high degree of what's called subcontracting, and I don't know how much people are familiar with this, but let me, let me just put this out to you, because it, it, it's, I asked this question of the uh, business students in, uh, in, in, in Denmark, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask the same question, and we'll get into a little bit of a conversation. Um, a buyer from say a Swedish retailer or a British retailer or whoever, uh, buying t-shirts will come to Bangladesh and will say one year, uh, okay, we'll give you $1.50 per t-shirt. And the next year they'll come and say, you know what, we're kind of really struggling back home, profitability's down, costs are up, uh, we want a t-shirt for $1.40. Oh, but, uh, in return for that, we're prepared to kind of increase the order, let's say from half a million, to, let's call it 750,000 units. Right? So now I ask you the question, if you were a manager in Bangladesh, how would you manage that? You either say no, can't do it, in which case you've lost the order and you might never get the order from that retailer again, and it goes to somebody else elsewhere in the industry. Let's say you're going to keep, keep the order, right? You, you, want to, you want to do this. How would you manage that? First starter for 10, as we say in quizzes back home. Yeah. Well, you build four more floors on your factory and employ 3,000 more girls. Uh, one way to go. You can, uh, the, the only thing about that is that interest rates are really high in Bangladesh on construction, but it's a way, it's, it's a, that's the way to go if everybody's kind of coming to you and wanting your product. Yeah, that's what you do. Yeah? You make your workers work longer hours. You may, exactly. You make your workers work longer hours. Uh, you may or may not pay them an overtime rate, depending kind of where you are in the sector. And that's the kind of thing that's not being explained in these documentaries. Um, uh, what's another thing you can do? Yeah? You get Order to other small, small right, right, and this is a fundamental problem in Bangladesh. You subcontract to a factory where you where where you know you can get it done for that price, maybe even less than that, and then you earn a bit. Okay, so if it's less than cost, you can you can actually make a bit of profit on a on a deal that you you personally can't actually uh, do. Now, why is that important? Because and I'll, I'll tell you, in, when the Spectrum factory collapsed, not one of the buyers who were in there knew that they were in there. Not one. Um, similarly with Rana Plaza, uh, where, you know, there's 28, 28 buyers have been identified from Labels Fund. Only nine turned up to a meeting in Geneva two weeks ago. A number of them saying, well, we weren't in there. Or a number of saying, well, we were in there, but we were in there two years ago. And therefore, thank you, we're not, it's not, not our problem. Okay, and it's something we need to kind of, kind of discuss. So, very quickly, what do you do as a country like Bangladesh to kind of reposition yourself in this value chain where predominantly most of your factories are right at the bottom of that value curve? How do you make more money out of this? Um, in the value chain literature, uh, they, they talk about economic upgrading where you, you either you, you kind of need to move that way because the curve's going up there or you kind of move that way uh, you go upstream or downstream they call it backward or forward linkage uh, in an effort to reposition yourself on the value chain now that, that has, has been happening in Bangladesh in a number of different ways firstly um, you functionally upgrade, that's a technical term, don't worry about it. Basically what it means is if I have just, you know, if, if I have a factory where basically it's full of sewing machines and some cutting tables, 
I need to functionally upgrade, and, and if the money is in fabric, well, why don't I try and make fabric? Now, we have to make a distinction here, and this is technical stuff about the textile industry, between woven and non-woven. Woven fabric, you've, you've probably seen pictures of these enormous weaving sheds, and they are big, and they require a lot of capital investment, and that's not a path, that, a road that Bangladesh, correct me if I'm wrong, has gone down. It's, it, they have spinning, because they need the yarn, the thread, to, for, the, for the whole clothing industry. But what they have done, and this is interesting, they've invested in non-wovens, which is knitwear. So a lot of the products that you're probably wearing now, t-shirts, sweatshirts like that, um, are made from tubular jersey. And you, you invest in what's called a circular knitting machine, which is like a big drum with some kind of arms that you loop uh, the thread in. Actually, amazing things. But, you know, we could, have, we could have a fabric facility in this room. And if it was producing around the clock, I would then have the fabric and I can retain that part of the value. So I've functionally upgraded, changed what I'm doing from just assembling to actually making the fabric. Um, the other thing I can do is I upgrade my process. In other words, I look at what's happening on the assembly line and I, uh, uh, I have to change that. I re-engineer it so that it's going to be moving a lot quick, more quickly. I might have to even take some workers out to become much more efficient. So there's a lot of productivity initiatives. German, uh, uh, German um, the JIZ, which is the, uh, so it's a kind of company for international <coughs> development, has invested a lot in that. I've already mentioned it's it's partly um, uh, functional upgrading, but you can uh, kind of think about upgrading your product. Generally, T-shirts, like, as we know, are low value. Okay, um, it, it, you you might want to get out of T-shirts and get into o other garments that are technically more involved and therefore are going to cost more. And you start moving up in, 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 in different levels or different parts of the uh, fashion fashion market. The other thing you do, and that's what some, actually some uh, um, uh, entrepreneurs have done in uh, Bangladesh, is they just move out of the chain altogether. They chain upgrade, they get into computing or property management or whatever it is. And they've kind of had enough of, there's no money to be made. The other thing that's been happening in Bangladesh is they've looked to south-south uh, um, exporting, to new markets, particularly uh, in, in Latin America. And uh, one of the other uh, factors that's impinged on the Bangladesh market is trading rules. And in particular, uh, the uh, Everything But Arms initiative uh, that's come through from the European Union, which supports less developed countries and therefore doesn't apply tariffs on imports coming in from Bangladesh, unlike the United States. And that explains, for example, knitwear, uh, how it's like shot up uh, and largely going to EU countries ra rather rather than the US. Now, what does that mean? And you mentioned it exactly, Helena, before. An enormous expansion during this period in factories. When I was doing research for this book, uh, I came across a statistic from the uh, the president of the Knitwear Manufacturers Association, and I think this would have been around about 2005-6, and he was saying we've got factories being opened every month, one a month. Now, in order to climb onto this bandwagon, and the expansion has largely been in knitwear, right? Uh, you need to get your fact. You, know, you need to get the other floors up and running, or you need to start building. And basically, building starts before planning is approved. That's a kind of what happens in Bangladesh. And that, in the case of Spectrum and in the case of Rana Plaza, neither owners had planning approval before they began to even build, let alone build up on what was really only a, a, you know, allowed at five levels instead of, instead of eight. Uh, right, I'm, I'm going on to health and safety now, but what I'll do, I'll pause there um, um, and invite questions, and maybe Helena, if you want to kind of come yeah. in at this point as well, but we, I can say one, one, yeah. one person wants to. Yeah, is, is it true that an engineer deemed the whole building unstable the day before the collapse yeah. of the Bangladesh. Yes, the crack appeared uh, and um, the uh, bank and the office uh, on the lower floors, uh, well they were all evacuated and the <coughs> banks and the, uh, the bank workers and the office workers stayed away. 
but the clothing workers were sent back in. Okay, yeah, because that's what I heard that the yeah. like owners of like for instance Primark and H and M and stuff, uh, they claim that they're not the ones who told the workers to go back inside the building. It was the people who had the subcontracts or whatever. Uh, well, uh, 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 Primark, for example, was uh, in uh, New Wave Bottoms, um, uh, which was one of the floor, one of the factories on one of the floors, and it knew it was in there, unlike some of the others. Uh, and and it's probably true they would, uh, you know, if, if Primark staff had been there, they probably would not have um, forced those workers back in. But I come back to this point. Why are the local managers doing it, and does that necessarily, does that necessarily exonerate Primark? But there is also a, another piece of truth here, which is that if you're not, if you don't go into the factory as a garment worker, you lose three days' wage. So it's not like it really easy to stay at home. It's not like you can vabba or go home and be sick. You actually lose a lot of money, and considering the low wages, that's actually not eating for three days. So the pressure is on full on and it, it takes a lot for uh, for the girls themselves to have the guts to not go in there. Sh there that's also one thing that you probably will discuss, I mean how you create sort of a, a situation where the girls uh, can afford not to go in. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, well, I think you can hear me. Uh, are you familiar, are either of you familiar with the Fair Labor Association? I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. So I know that H&M is a member of the Fair Labor Association, but I know that not, um, they have factories in three different countries, but I know only one of the countries is really certified. I can't remember. Cambodia would be another H&M mm. sourcing company. But I guess my point is, if this is happening, if you know H&M is really enthusiastic about being part of something like the Fair Labor Association, but there's a disconnect between their efforts and then what's actually happening at all of the factories, which of course is hard to control when it's such a large number of factories. How, I don't know, how can these larger corporations here really try to improve things in these other parts of the world? It seems like so difficult. They're already making this first step to be, to have these standards that the Fair Labor Association has and then if it's not really yeah. working, I don't know. I don't good, know if that's good question, but uh, can we can we yeah, park yeah, that yeah. until <laughs> later because uh, the, the, there is Big something we can important talk question. About. Uh, it's really not a question. I only wanted to come at the previous um, uh, question. Uh, in, uh, as to subcontracting and the responsibility <coughs> in uh, Norway, for example. Uh, the uh, if if you make a deal in in, in con construction, mm -hmm. uh, let's say in some city uh, buys uh, something from a construction company, uh, the main contractor is uh, in this case the city is is um, responsible for uh, the whole chain. Mm -hmm. So even if the uh, main company uh, subcontracts uh, to various uh, manufacturers uh, you have a responsibility uh, under the penalty of heavy fines so so I mean it's not impossible to yeah can I respond to that um, you're absolutely right the uh, a number of um, big brands will specify in their commercial contracts there shall be no illegal subcontracting and there'll be no subcontracting where we have no knowledge of it and if there is there will be penalties okay um, the kind of issue is are they policing that right now the big issue around Rana Plaza and Walmart's position which is basically said no we knew nothing about our product in there that had been illegally placed therefore sorry we that's not us right um, and of course they I think they've discontinued any orders with the prime contractor that they would have gone through in the first place uh, the, the argument that comes then is well you should have known it's up to you to you know have this overview of what's going on 
um, you should be going into factories. I'll tell you a quick story on this. Earlier this year, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a Swiss company that actually wanted to pay more money around the living wage, was prepared to pay more. They asked me to go to, and, and consult with the workers and management in two factories in Bangladesh where they had T-shirts made. Right? Now, they were, they were kind of one of about 45 buyers that were in there, so they weren't going to make a big wave, big change. And in fact, the workers were only going to get a one-off payment of about 400 taka, which is not a lot of money, but was still something for them. Uh, both the management and the, uh, the workers said, yeah, great idea. We want, it, want everybody in the factory to have it. Uh, signed a memorandum of understanding. Then the verification uh, coordinators from the fair way, it's like the fair labour only in, 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 in the Netherlands, then went, uh, were running an audit on the, on the factory at that time. Couldn't find the product. It'd be <laughs> subcontracted, despite the memorandum of understanding. So, you know, you kind of... I mean, at least, they were, at least they, they, they were policing that, and, and I think that that's a whole area that needs to be, be step, stepped up. And, and that's also good for many areas in Bangladesh. When we talk now and talk about the construction and about the, 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 the building permission, yeah. we must consider the deep corruption and the, the lack of capacity that is, is uh, so clearly a problem for Bangladesh. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes for the whole, I mean, from everything. And also to today, the, 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 the call for engineers to come and, and, and uh, look at the factories, that there are actually not that many engineers that can do this. So that, that's a major yeah. issue. Yeah, I think yeah. somebody else had their hand up somewhere. Yeah. No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm from Bangladesh. And Welcome. And I was there in rescue mission while at Rana Plaza. Oh, right. So maybe I can share something yeah. later. But uh, to answer your question, have you heard the term corporate greed? Well, yes. <laughs> yes. Corporate greed, yeah. Okay. So the thing is that about the subcontract, do you really think that uh, the Primark or the agent them they doesn't know? They don't know uh, that there has been subcontract? Mm -hmm. No. Most of the time they know. How? I have many friends, they are working on the government sector as quality control or supervisor. Actually, they are uh, working on behalf of the uh, buyers. So they know that there has been some contract. But the thing is that in this world, only this is the Bangladesh or the China, they can produce the lowest uh, cost. They can, they can provide you in the lowest cost. Nobody, no other can give that. So. It is sometimes it is intentional as well, and also I, I would like to uh, mention about the size of the uh, factories. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, we used to have bigger factories, but the factories are now becoming smaller and more smaller. There are some machines; uh, maybe it needs 20 workers, sometimes 10 workers to operate. What we have found that in my area, uh, I'm, I live in Dhaka, and in my area I found more than 1,000 garments factory is simply like a dwelling house in a, a ground floor yeah. uh, maybe uh, inside the ground floor there are one or two machines maybe working uh, 20 or 40 people uh, in uh, outside of the house you cannot uh, uh, recognize that this is a garments thing garments factory but this is garments factory actually they are now doing the, something like cloud garments factory on that way so maybe you have uh, one lakh, uh, 10,000 10, piece order or 100,000 piece order, and these are splitting up into these small factories. So this, uh, this is how uh, the, um, it's working, and uh, often it is not possible to recognize these kind of factories, some kind of hidden factory, you can say. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, maybe we should kind of move on to the, the human cost of, of this and uh, just following on from, from corporate greed, I mean we can, we can have a whole discussion about the issue of living wage and basic needs not being met and excessive overtime. I don't really want to uh, uh, get, into, get into that but I just, I just want to take you through some of the official um, uh, records on health and safety. And I'm sure you will, uh, our friend from Bangladesh will tell us that 
the unofficial number of accidents is much, much higher. Um, up on, when I was doing work for this book, um, and I just went back to 1990, there was virtually, um, on average, uh, although we'd say some years were worse than others, but a, a, a disaster a year, and uh, the fatalities were, were, were serious enough. Um, but the, the factory inspectorate is woefully uh, understaffed, um, and uh, the, the worst disaster up until that point had been uh, Chowdhury Nitwares in, 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 in 2000. And um, the Spectrum uh, factory collapse, which occurred during a night shift in Savar, uh, was really a wake-up call. It, it also occurred at the time that the whole global industry was undergoing a, a change because there was an agreement on uh, um, uh, textiles and clothing, which was phasing out quotas. It's, uh, it's too technical a story to get into. To put, put it simply, everybody thought that production was going to go to India and China as the most favourable sources of uh, supply. But um, uh, back in Europe, once the, the, uh, the rules changed and uh, the Europe became flood, was flooded with Chinese product, uh, there was a mobilisation by some of the main industries, uh, Italy in particular, uh, through the EU to re reimpose uh, quotas for another four years. And what that did, it, it, it basically re rerouted orders into Cambodia and into Bangladesh. Uh, but, but even beyond the four years that were added on, uh, you know, Bangladesh has, con has continued to thrive despite kind of uh, things like this. Now, what's, what's astonishing is that there was a major debate after this collapse uh, about structural audits. Up until then, when a, when a social auditor went into a factory, they were largely looking at working conditions, they were looking at health and safety, and they'd take photographs. But with the best will in the world, a social auditor is not a civil engineer. Uh, but there was a demand that uh, auditors, um, or rather factories, make sure that they had a certificate of, if you like, structural integrity signed by um, a, a civil engineer as, as part of the audit process and that was never really picked up properly by the industry and even companies like Primo um, have, have, have confessed that, 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 that this wasn't on their on their radar. Um, now uh, 62 people died in Spectrum and there were 84 injured and that led to uh, the first concerted effort to address the issue of compensation which I'll come on to a little bit later. Uh, but uh, it wasn't long before there were other disasters. Fire at KTS Textiles, 54 dead, 60 injured. Uh, Phoenix Garments was another factory collapse, but it was in a kind of shopping uh, mall. Uh, 22 died, 50 uh, injured. The Imam Group in Chittagong, 57 injured. Garib and Garib, um, an H&M supplier, uh, 21 dead. Um, uh, 20 injured in a stampede at uh, Tunghai Knit and Sweater. Uh, then the Hamim Group, uh, that's it, sportswear. Uh, there was a, a, a fire in the, in the lunch break, fortunately, because this is a really high level at that corner. I, I think there's at least 20 stories in that, in that uh, factory, and the fire was kind of on the top floor. Um, and then, then we had, uh, um, before Tazreen, we had in Pakistan, the Ali Enterprises fire, which then became the worst disaster in the industry. And the, the significant fact about that uh, fire was that SA8000, which is a, it's called Social Accountability International, it's a, it's a global standard on social, stand, on social um, uh, rights, if you like, um, and, 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 a, and a factory accreditation process. So, Factories would have auditors that would go in and, and certify them as, uh, as, as meeting this global standard. And it had an audit three months before that fire. And it, it passed it, give it a clean bill of health. And that there's, now, there's been a major crisis now in, in the auditing industry, particularly at SA8000, uh, as a result of that. And then we got Rana Plaza, Tazreen, uh, back in Bangladesh, Tazreen. And then this awful, awful uh, collapse. 
uh, resulting in uh, you know 1,130 uh, and probably more um, workers uh, dead and 2,500 uh, injured. And you know what, what's often not taken into consideration is you have rendered also the surviving workers unemployed overnight. You've also bearing in mind that these workers who have uh, died or are seriously injured are the main breadwinners for thousands of other Bangladeshis uh, in and around uh, the outlying uh, countryside. And that is, just shows you uh, some, a photo from the Garib and Garib. Uh, frankly, note the padlock on the gate. Um, locked. Um, there's the Hamim. Uh, fire. Fortunately, as we say, most people were uh, out at their lunch break when it uh, broke out. Uh, the Karachi fire, the Ali Enterprises, 289 perished. And uh, Tazreen, uh, um, with Tazreen, the, uh, the smoke, uh, the fire broke out and the smoke was billowing up from below. And the workers said to the management, uh, what's going on, we want to get out. And they were sent back up by, by the management. Again, we have to ask questions, what's, you know, what's driving this? Um, and the similar thing happened, uh, I think somebody posed a question about uh, Rana Plaza. Uh, the, the crack emerged the day before. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess it probably emerged earlier than that, yeah. to be honest. It depends often very much on, on the kind of trigger uh, in the in the uh, in the factory and where where the weakness weakness is. Uh, but the you know the workers were were, were sent sent back in. So um, the, the, this is this is kind of uh, a watershed moment. It has to be. It's the worst industrial disaster ever. You, um, Bhopal was a kind of different thing. That was awful as that was, but in terms of an actual industrial facility, this is the worst industrial disaster ever. And uh, that's kind of what the building was like before it happened, and you had expansion on the upper floors, um, and you had actually five um, uh, different companies in there, five, five different companies on the different floors. Now, two weeks ago, uh, we had nine of the brands in a room uh, in Geneva, and one of the buyers from, uh, 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 I think a French company, um, when we were talking about the overall production that came out of that complex, uh, there, there was a figure of 10 million units mentioned. Whereupon this, this buyer said, well in that case, it was much more than 28, 28 brands that were in there over a period of time. And he reckons it was probably 100. Associated at different points. Now this is the problem with outsourced fashion. You have in any factory at any one time uh, consignments going through, they may last, uh, you know, may take five or six weeks and then they're gone again. And they may come back, they may never come back. Um, and so it's difficult to, to have some kind of ongoing, often an ongoing relationship between the buyer in the supplier, and there are only certain parts of the market, if you like, where uh, product is made in bulk uh, uh, over a longer period of time, where such relationships can be uh, struck. So here's the here's the impact um, figures that I've kind of mentioned before, and this the, these figures are changing all the time. There's more and more information. You know, there's 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 a, a number of workers still missing. There's DNA tests still being carried out, um, and uh, the the problem is that the kind of magnitude now. You know, th this was bad enough with 62 dead, but when you look at uh, um, you know 1,200 uh, uh, well, sorry 1,100 uh, plus wor workers, and then and then some seriously injured. And if you're seriously injured, meaning permanently injured in Bangladesh, that means you will never work again, right? Uh, and, and we have to kind of now consider the situation on compensation. 
Back in 2005, before the passage of the 2006 Labour Act, the uh, level of compensation by law was 21,000 taka. 21,000 taka. So, you know, let's call that a fifth, uh, let's call it 2,000, 2,000 Swedish krona. That's what a person got, sorry, a family got, one-off payment, for pain and suffering, for loss of earnings, uh, forevermore, um, under under the law. And that, that law, by the way, had been passed under the British Empire in 1923. Um, to be fair, the Employers Association rounded that off. They would put 79,000 taka to, towards a rounded off figure of 100,000. Sometimes they wouldn't, might not pay it, um, but, but that was the level, uh, that was the amount of money that, as far as the Employers Association was concerned, BGMEA is the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association. Uh, that's what they would uh, impress upon their member companies to pay. Um, in 2006, the law was changed, and that figure then went up from 21,000 to 100,000. And then the employer said, okay, then we add another 100,000 to that. But gradually, bit by bit, this compensation uh, figure has been moving, moving upwards. But look at the figure for permanent disability. You know, you get 125,000. I'm sorry, with that, that's kind of it. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's kind of pause at this point and think about. Um, Compensation and responsibility. And who's responsible here? Who should pay uh, or have to pay? And what should be their re respective contribution? Uh, and what should the figure be? Is it, uh, are questions that have been exercising various people, uh, particularly in recent years with the, with the recent disasters. And, um, and I, I throw that out. I throw that out to you before I can before I show you some figures. I mean, I just invite you to kind of uh, come up with a your own figures. What you think uh, should be a level of compensation for a deceased worker's family? What should a um, what should a, a, a seriously injured worker get? Uh, and who should pay for it? Who should contribute to that? Yeah. I think it's worth talking a little bit about BGMEA as well, yeah. uh, as a very interesting uh, institution in Bangladesh. Uh, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, otherwise, you know. Uh, well, I can do, but um, maybe, do you, do you want to say something? Well, well um, I don't know, but from my understanding and from, from living in Bangladesh for three years, BGMA EA are very closely affiliated to pol the, the politics of Bangladesh, the politicians, and also to the general, the financial elite. So they're not, they're not the best of guys, let's put it that way. Or do you, would you agree with me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're not very interested. They are the ones that are keeping the w wages low. They're the ones that are not willing to discuss minimum wages in Bangladesh. And I have myself sat around round table discussions with them, and they are they don't see uh, the, their own role in this. Um, uh, and they they are not necessarily the f in the front of uh, workers' safety either. But probably you know more about that. Could you? Uh, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think uh, the uh, I think one third of the parliament in Bangladesh uh, is made up of factory owners. So they, uh, and secondly, they wield enormous control over their members because I can't remember what year it was, but the Bangladesh government, for whatever reason, gave what's called the um, uh, the utilisation declaration right. To the BGMEA, what that means is that it's almost like an export license. Uh, the permission to import and export, fa you know, fabric and export assembled garments, uh, originally was given by the government, but for some reason they passed it over the BGMEA. That has an enormous disciplinary impact. 
any any employer that kind of wants to pay a living wage or even recognize a trade union will be pulled into line by the BGME and say we'll, we'll withdraw the utilization declaration if you carry on like that. So I mean that's kind of where the fundamental change needs to be. Do you think there will be change? Have you heard any sounds from that end? Uh, not, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they, 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 we've got an election coming up and it's going to be interesting to see kind of what happens there. But, but even, you know, even with an Awami League majority at the moment, you still have a substantial number of factory owners in, in Parliament. And I think with the National Part, Nationalist Party, I think that's equally, you know, they're very entrenched in the elite, as you were saying. And, uh, but, uh, I mean, that would be an interesting um, legislative uh, enactment to bring u the utilisation declaration back into the, into the uh, as a power of the government to award. Because that, that's what sort of disgusts me as a, as a development worker and, and as a writer. It is the, the, the uh, complete uh, uninterest for, from the elite in Bangladesh of their own people. Uh, I, or, do you agree? Uh, I'd like to uh, add something to yeah. that. Two of my uncle, they have their own garments factory. So yeah. I asked them why people are uh, actually don't you are not paying more. There are some factors behind. One thing is the risk of business is so high in Bangladesh. One, sorry, the, the risk of the business. risk, okay. yeah, so high in Bangladesh. Second one is we don't produce the raw materials. Mm -hmm. Even the cotton, uh, even uh, the uh, dyeing color, everything is there imported mm -hmm. from China. Uh, some uh, from Turkey or India. Yeah. So while we are competing with China or India using their raw materials, definitely we have to have some solutions. We have to lower our price. That is one of the problem. Third one is uh, uh, the imp the social impact of this garments industry is uh, it's a huge impact. Right now in Dhaka, we cannot find any housemate because all the girls. Almost all the girls, they are going to the garments industry instead of working domestic, instead of being domestic worker inside the house. So uh, this is also one kind of a political issue as well. Uh, a member of the parliament, uh, he will give more opportunity to the people of his own electoral area. So this kind of things also works. So these are complicated things. It is not the greed as well. It is also the some kind of instability of this sector. And, uh, and also uh, the global uh, corporate grid works as well. So I would like to uh, put the burden uh, equally on the governments, the BGME and the international buyer as well. It is not, uh, uh, it will not be correct uh, to uh, bar put the, all the burden to the BGME. It is, I think it will not yeah. be correct. No, no, you're well, right. But they often, yeah. they often get, get off lightly and uh, the uh, blame is put mostly on the yeah. uh, international buyers. But uh, but you but you are uh, you are right that it's not an easy business. But on the other hand, the the uh, the profits are enormous as well. So there is also ri risk mitigation that could be. I think we have a point there. Yeah. Should I wait? Um, my main CSR experience comes from the company, the American clothing company Patagonia. Okay. Do you know it? Yeah. yeah. So their uh, leaders of that company actually wanted their the factories that they use to have a better wage. They really want to implement this whole living mm -hmm. wage thing. And so uh, I was <coughs> wanted to say, one, that they actually couldn't do that because of the same reasons that other companies are trying to get the wages down. So there's some legal issues with saying, oh, can we make this standard thing that we want to pay? even though it's higher, there's some legal issues because most of the time people are trying to bring it down and pay as little as possible. So there's challenges from companies, Western, American, and European companies that are trying to do good things. Yeah. And then the other question I had was if um, the companies themselves could be a source of motivation for the factory owners or managers, whatever, to implement higher wages. If they're saying maybe we only want to work with you if you're going to do, I don't know if that's possible, but because you know, here we have where the consumers have a lot of power. We want to buy this, we don't want to buy this, and companies change. So maybe if, I don't know. If, 
Yeah, th th there is some issues there that uh, it'd be interesting to hear what you say about about wanting to pay higher wages. It's not that easy for some reason. Thank you. Uh, I'm also from Bangladesh, and uh, I'm listening what he's saying. Uh, most of his facts are, are real, and um, uh, I don't think that uh, BGMEA should should pay. I'm, uh, you are right that they are very elite and very powerful organization in Bangladesh. But uh, we are talking about um, uh, transnational uh, multi uh, corporation, uh, corporations. I mean, uh, like when BP's uh, accident happened in in Mexi Gulf of Mexico, America was so powerful that they could they say that you must pay, you must pay uh, for damage. But for Bangladesh, it's very poor countries. They just cannot say that you have to do it, that big, big corporations, they go uh, in Bangladesh or other countries. So we don't have any uh, uh, international law for um, transnational or multinational uh, companies. When they go for other countries, how, how do you sue them? Because they, you cannot sue them because uh, companies like H H and H and M Swedish company, they are registered in Sudan. And Jara is a Spanish company. Uh, they are registered in in Spain or Walmart in USA. So uh, by law, they are obligated in their own country. It's like it's registered in Sweden. So Swedish law can sue them. Bangladeshi law cannot sue them because there is no international law. So all these big companies now they are talking about they should have an international law for big companies. So I think. Uh, it's not only BGMEA or Bangladeshi government's factories. It should be uh, international uh, corporations like uh, Swedish company or, or, or American company. They should also uh, provide compensation. Yeah. Thank you. yeah, I'm sure you have reflections. On well, that. Uh, I don't, but the Industrial, the Global Union, the Clean Clothes Campaign and the Worker Rights Consortium have worked with the unions in Bangladesh to come up with a proposal for compensation and a proposal for the distribution. Um, and this is it. Uh, total amount, uh, seven, nearly $75 million to cover the co uh, uh, appropriate compensation for uh, all the families of the deceased and the injured. Uh, to break that down in terms of what that would mean per worker, it's 5,000 taka uh, times 25 years service, okay, uh, plus 6.25% uh, in year on year inflation. It's a complicated calculation, but that's kind of what the figure comes out, out at for um, the injured workers and the deceased workers. And that, the injured is all subject to medical assessments. Um, but look at the percent, you know, look at what, how they see who, who should pay what. And we shouldn't forget the owner, by the way. And uh, the High Court has um, ruled that uh, his asset should, should now be, it's, they call it frozen, but actually it's unfrozen so that they can get at it to, to you know, add to the compensation uh, claim. Um, so it's 18% BGM a year, 9% government. 28% owner and 45% from the brands. But here's the thing, right? We often talk about lack of solidarity amongst workers. You try and get 28 brands, uh, first of all, to turn up to a meeting, and those that turn up to a meeting, try and get them to agree on 45%. And kind of how do you do that? We had major problems. I mean, we weren't in the room. We were sent out the room uh, when the ILO tried to get the nine brands who had turned up to kind of address this question. And the, what they really wanted them to do, because they know that retailers have different levels of profitability. You know, some are like big earners, some not so big. So how were they, I think they were trying to have some kind of categorization of contribution. And basically, because the others weren't there, how, how, what, what are they gonna do? They can't, they can't. So, what happened was, and I, uh, I mean, this is already kind of circulating, and it's 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 an interesting uh, uh, development that of all companies, Primark um, have 
actually opened bank accounts have registered 3,300 Rana Plaza workers have uh, um, opened bank accounts for them and have already paid them three, th uh, three months salary and they're going to pay another three months. Okay? But they're also wanting to develop a proper, um, if you like, pension scheme but only for the workers of New Wave Bottoms where they had production. Now, now there are elements of that scheme which are kind of really interesting uh, and actually, you know, I've got to say it, the guy who uh, was the architect of the Spectrum scheme is working as a consultant now for Primark. So this is kind of following through. Um, but it's, you know, what you, what you find is that there are some companies that are prepared to pay something, but they're kind of not prepared to get involved in administering a scheme because it's a massive amount of work. And the fact that over 3,000 workers are registered with bank accounts is an enormous step because you can, you can pay money into a fund and then you could transfer. One of the big problems that emerged with Spectrum was this inability to get money into Bangladesh and then out to the, out to the workers. But what is the jurisdiction? Which yeah. is this young man's question in a way. Yeah. But what is the jurisdiction? Good point. So the High Court has instructed uh, the establishment of two committees to look at what should be the appropriate level of compensation for the victims and the whole question of medical assessment. Right? Now, uh, they've come up with a figure broadly in line with this, about 1.8 million taka per family. Right? But the apportionment, the division, they've sent back, they've, they've referred it back to the High Court to determine who, who should pay, who, who should contribute what. Now, here's my question. I don't think the High Court either can or will rule on a multinational's contribution. No, no. It's not possible. It's not possible. <coughs> how does the High Court, how come they do It's like, like UN can do it, but UN, they don't have international law yet. Exactly. Well, and the ILO are... won't do it. The ILO isn't going to do it, right? What the ILO is prepared to do, and then I'll shut up, is, 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 um, is offer technical expertise in, um, in the administration of a scheme, but not, uh, it will not get involved in um, establishing the fund from the outset or apportioning. It's kind of convened the meetings, but it's then like sat back and it has to be very, very careful how, how it maneuvers its way, way through for the reasons you mentioned as well. Yeah, sorry. No, I was going to mention Ruggie here, the, the UN framework yeah. on business and human rights that yeah. was uh, uh, actually um, decided upon just a year before, which is a, a, an attempt from the UN side to, to uh, get the business sector and the corporate sector into the human rights framework. Do, could you comment on that? Has that been sort of a, a way forward in this? Or? Um, well, the... The, the Ruggy principles uh, in the kit, the, uh, uh, remind me again, there's three. There's protect, respect and, remedy. Res respect and remedy. And remedy is kind of the most important in this case. Uh, but uh, the, the noises coming from the brands, uh, and it, it's very interesting, there is, um, uh, we, don't, we don't think we are criminally liable it, this was not our fault. Um, we're kind of prepared to pay some money, but we don't want to be um, kind of held over a barrel uh, 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 um, in terms of how we do this. Um, and there are other brands that just are oh, not, not even going to go there. Um, and and it, it gets us back to this um, kind of discussion that's not really happening about, you know, workers working too long, workers working in locked factories, uh, um, uh, multinationals not auditing uh, properly. So they, and there is a collective responsibility, but it's not a responsibility that's yet enforceable in law, for the reason you, you so said. So it wasn't useful in the Rana example, that's more, that's what, since you've been, you've been so involved in this case, yeah. Uh, my question is more, has the UN and the framework been helpful, or it hasn't been, well, been we, called upon? I had, a, I had a bit of a, what, uh, 
uh, one of the Danish brands, uh, I'll not mention the name, um, I, we got, I had to reply to this email on behalf of Industrial. And it was, you know, we object to being uh, kind of, uh, have this feeling that we're criminally liable in this case. Uh, you know, we're, we're not going to come to a meeting where there's this sort of sense, uh, this feeling hanging, hanging over it, over us. And, and I, I kind of, it, it, as part of the reply, I said, well, you know, it's about doing the right thing. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I mentioned the rugby principles, and the, the, there is a, a kind of joint responsibility. You know, you can, you can be elastic with words, you say you've got a moral responsibility moral corporate social responsibility as opposed to a you know you are you know you are liable i think part of the problem is that there may be um and i know this is happening in germany um vis-a-vis -vis, um kick which is one of the brands that was in there and it was the brand that was in ali enterprises in um, pakistan that um uh, i think it's femnet which is part of the clean clothes campaign is actually bringing an OECD complaint against Kick. Right now, it's quasi legal. The thing about OECD complaints is you can drag a company through a process, but at the end of the day, as we found with Adidas and an OECD complaint, you can agree to disagree. There's no teeth in the thing, right? Um, but in in the Spectrum case, for a moment, the the NGOs were taking legal advice about bringing a case uh, against the multinationals. Um, you can bring a case under the Fatal Injuries Act, uh, which goes back to something like 1855, uh, where you could sue for damages. Um, uh, normally what happens with compensation is, if you accept compensation, you kind of waive the right to take the employer uh, to court, that's all the employer's liability yeah, insurance thing. Um, uh, but but you can, you know you you can't still go down that road. But let's face it, if you do it in relation to multinationals, there's major issues around jurisdiction, and you would have to establish. Uh, uh, you, you can just see it now. The, the 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 lawyers acting on behalf of 28 brands are going to say, "Well, we weren't there when it happened." So, sorry. Or there might be so, and then the, the argument shifts to, well, but you were there in 2011 or 12, what were you doing to ensure the structural safety of this building? Um, and that's kind of where the, where the debate would be, you know? Who knows where, what the outcome would be? I think Katya wants to. I just have a question. I was like looking at, I'm sorry, I'm looking at, Who's gonna pay what? Yeah. And I think that there is someone missing from the list. Okay. But that's probably the idealist me speaking. But where are the Western governments? I mean, where are the Western consumers that are actually mm -hmm. benefiting from the labor of Bangladeshi workers? Mm -hmm. I mean, going back to the beginning of your presentation, you actually mentioned. Uh, WTO rules that were mm -hmm. negotiated mm -hmm. in order to allow less developed countries to export more, become more competitive, and it's precisely the competitive pressure that is causing all these industrial disasters. Uh, so ultimately, the degree of responsibility seems also to lie in the government that, in the Western governments that have pushed for these structural reforms mm. and competitive pressures mm. in Bangladesh. I mean, I think you can't pull it out that way. Once you start getting to uh, maybe governments and consumers, it just gets a bit more difficult, I think, to kind of pin, pin down um, who, which consumers and who are they, you know, are they gonna, um, But you do raise an important question, which is the sim simple, how are you going to do this? How on earth, and this is the big problem we have, right? That we have currently three different schemes. There's the industrial, there's this one. There's the Primark scheme, uh, which I believe probably has the most chance of getting brands to follow behind it. Whereas I, I think this is kind of the 45% is pissed off 
pot in English, is, is kind of uh, pissed off the, um, the, the the brands, and some of them are kind of. Oh. Um, and then just recently, uh, the the compensation committee in Bangladesh has come up with um, a set of figures not a million miles away from this, by the way. Um, but they've instructed the High Court to come up with this: who has to pay? But you see. The complicating factor is we're almost six months down the line and there's a lot of money gone in to Bangladesh. There's a lot of money being paid by, um, by the government. But the problem is accounting for this. I heard that Inditex, for example, the Zara, you mentioned Zara, it's the company behind Zara, had um, paid, it doesn't want, it kind of doesn't want to um, be, it, it historically was in there, but it basically doesn't want to be connected um, with the whole initiative, but it's, 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 they have these massive foundations. For them, half a million dollars is chicken feed. Okay? And so they're prepared to pay something. My understanding is that they had paid some money across to the, um, I think, to the BGMEA. Now, you want to see some accounts there. I want to see uh, bank, bank statements and receipts and that's, that's really the kind of uh, technical support maybe that the ILO will provide. Just yesterday, and I'm still waiting to get the email, the um, uh, kind of director of the Danish ETI, Ethical Trade Initiative, showed me this email. It went to about, I think, eight pages of contributions that have been made from all over the world to some fund to support the victims. And it's quite a substantial figure at the bottom, but I think it's taka rather than dollars, right? Uh, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping still that I'm gonna get, get this because it's a really important part of the mix. But it's like, you know, it, it's just this jigsaw puzzle that suddenly, uh, and, and, and it, needs, it needs a proper authority because, and this is, this is where we've come to now. I think we've got to a point where we need a sustainable, social welfare system in Bangladesh for workers, which doesn't exist. And so it's very easy, I would say, to set up a claims processing authority, an office where you would go. It's very easy, I would say, to have an oversight committee um, to check all the, uh, the, you know, the bank accounts and receipts and what have you. The hard bit is where's the money gonna come from to go into the fund? <coughs> Not, not this money we're talking about here, which will, some amount will be ultimately found that may get us hopefully somewhere near that, that figure. Might, might be less, might be more. Don't know. But rest assured there will be more accidents in Bangladesh. But there's, another, uh, there's, there's something else which has emerged from Rana uh, of a proactive nature, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But heaven forbid, in the event of future accidents, you don't want to be in this situation, which is, a, it's a mess. It's a complete mess from an accounting point of view. And also, you still, you're still going to have buyers who are going to say, weren't there, didn't know about the fact that it had been subcontracted. Um, anyway, we, uh, we're prepared to pay this, and that's it, out of our sense of moral responsibility. We'll dip into the foundation we have to do. And um, meanwhile, in, 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 I'll finish with this little anecdote. Uh, the, um, I'm very friendly with the, uh, the CSR manager of uh, Inditex in, in Bangladesh because because of my post, I had to work closely with him when we were writing the book. When Rana happened, he came up with this brainwave. He said, there are four mobile phone companies in Bangladesh, correct me if I'm wrong. How many mobile phone users are there in Bangladesh? You reckon maybe 10 million? Maybe? He said, what if each mobile phone company levied one taka per phone user? It wouldn't take much to suddenly have a fund that you could do something with. And I think he told this to the Minister of uh, Labour who thought it was an absolutely brilliant idea, but then he kind of consulted with various parties, including the BGMEA, I think. And then, and then the word that came back was, oh, but we want the brands to pay something. So it kind of, it 
knocked on the head, didn't happen. Okay. And so there's this dependent, you know, there, there is a recognition. Uh, and it, and, it, and, it, and it's, a, it's a valid recognition because of the price that has been paid for garments in Bangladesh. People think right away through the, the industry, that's like, you know, employers, workers, and other people, that, that Bangladesh is, being, I would say, is being super exploited. I've done a calculation on the, labor, the direct labor cost of a t-shirt. Five cents. Five cents is the direct labor cost of a t-shirt. Sorry, I'll show you. That's, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> now, is this your wrap up, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. Or if you want I have to got, I have got one, one thing to, um, to say about... <coughs> This is really short. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Just, to me, uh, the biggest problem, I know you already said what you think you're, the biggest problem is, but to me the biggest problem is that there is such a disconnect between the companies and, um, like, and the workers' lives, their personal and work lives, and how they're connected. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, again, to use Patagonia as an example, is that they purposefully, even though they know if they might have a lot of orders coming in, they won't place the order because they know that down the line that means overtime, probably unpaid for workers in these factories, and that means all this other stuff. And the, there aren't a lot of companies doing this, and mm -hmm. it's such a problem. Yeah, but I just think that that, and I really am so excited to hear so many people talking about or touching on world systems theory stuff because it it's not just one cause, one problem, one thing going on. Mm. It's a lot of different mm. stuff. So I'm really excited. <laughs> Sorry, I, I wanted to come back on the point you made. You were making about Patagonia before in relation to wanting to move things up with other companies. Mm. You know, no. The thing that's dragging, um, and this is true of the whole industry, and the, the fair, fair, I've been to Fair Labour Association meetings. And at the beginning of every Fair Labour Association meeting, the lawyer stands up and reminds everybody about antitrust law, mm. which basically means that, employ uh, that companies are not allowed to talk about cost or price amongst each other. Uh, and, and for that reason, they, they always keep bringing this up as a way of stifling discussion between companies about addressing a living wage. Uh, and and uh, what we're trying to do at the moment is move the debate on this to get a serious discussion about antitrust, or we call it Euro European law, competition law. Um, and I do, you know, I do think that that's, uh, it's time to, to change that. In fact, in the United States, and we're not, I haven't even talked about this yet, collective agreements were always exempt from antitrust law. Because what's a collective agreement? It's an attempt to take wages out of competition by agreeing on rates of, rates of pay uh, for large groups of workers. Ideally, sectorally is what you need in Bangladesh. Not, not a minimum wage declaration that we get in maybe two weeks' time or whatever. Um, that will probably, I reckon, is going to be, I don't know what you think, 5,000 maybe? Yeah. If the employers are saying 3,600, that's why you've got riots. Uh, the unions and the <coughs> Centre for Policy Dialogue are saying about 8,100. The question, I think, is hovering over us all here, yeah. uh, and the question that comes back and, and back again is, is there anything we can do to support the garment girls? And should we, I mean, you hear about the brands, they're not turning up, they're not showing any any kind of high yeah. moral. Should we boycott certain brands? What, what, what's your take yeah. on that? I'm no big fan of boycotts, uh, unless there's a clear instruction come through from the workers that are factory uh, that that's what they want to see happen um, because you're just going to harm them doing that. Uh, having said that, uh, ultimately what are companies worried about in terms of adverse publicity? It is that are two things, either consumers are going to go and buy product elsewhere because it, 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 there's an adverse image going out about them or ethical investors uh, in those companies are going to kind of Turn and turn uh, turn away. Um, so there is that kind of uh, threat around uh, where where the mar you know the, the market will will be affected by negative uh, publicity, and therefore um, that's why the NGOs and I've got to say this. I mean, I spent eight years in a global union, and the, where the real change was was caused by journalists and NGOs, by you know by stories emerging. 
and then and then obviously the unions would get get in there and use that space to get get some change, uh, because basically it's a very very poorly organised industry. Uh, uh, for a whole period, we we had no dialogue whatsoever with the big brands. It's changed now, largely through multi-stakeholder initiatives. And the point uh, that 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 Rana has. Uh, there's been a major, major development as a result of Rana that, that changes the picture of the, uh, the sector in Bangladesh, the sector globally, and it has, an Im uh, has a potential impact for industry worldwide, which is, um, and let me just uh, jump to this, uh, sorry, oh, no, uh, mm -hmm. back, Bing. that. It's the Building and Safety Accord which has been signed between two global unions and 90 global brands. They have to um, uh, 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 fund a whole credible factory inspection program. They have to engage in remediation into of whatever faults are found. They have to train worker representatives to uh, form safety committees. There's a complaints, it's a legally binding complaints process and they're, they're um, it, it built into it is transparency and reporting. That's absolutely unprecedented, okay? It's not really up and running yet. It's taken a good while to, they've just appointed a, an executive director in Bangladesh and an executive director in, in Amsterdam to kind of liaise with the brands. But there's a substantial amount of money come in there. Typically though, Gap and Walmart said, no, we're not having this. It's legally binding, we don't like that idea, so they've gone off and formed their own largely US thing, and the crazy thing is that they're nearly all in the same factories. So you've kind of got this overlapping duplication that's not necessary. There's also a national action plan in, 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 in uh, Bangladesh um, that the ILO has, um, is, is backing. So there's kind of, you know, and this, this potentially, and it gets us into other areas to do with ours, to do with um, uh, wages, that if you have uh, uh, a framework within which some of the biggest brands in the world and in the industry are coming together, then it's what can you do with that in other areas, not just around um, sa safety measures, but around compensation uh, and around pay. Um, I think it was very interesting what you said about um, the publicity and the media for the brands, but as I've understood it, this is a problem in the general garment industry. So it's very difficult to, you can say, you can give bad medias for some brands, but as it is a, you know issue in the whole industry, I don't see how that's um, a solid solution in a way. What about somehow adding more alternatives on the market for consumers because then you would also have to change the whole consumer um, consumerism as it is today because people will spend money and if they don't know where to spend their money uh, in a what you call it, sustainable way yeah. or in a fair yeah. trade way yeah. then what's all of this marketing and all of this putting pressure on the, the big brands will not work as I see mm -hmm. it so I think we also need to create more alternatives fair trade alternatives yeah. um, the, the, yeah, good point. There is like a niche, I would still call it a niche ethical fashion market. Uh, it's it's growing. There are new, uh, I, I'm always getting emails that we have in the UK a thing called the Ethical Fashion Forum. And pretty much on a daily basis I get, I get an, yet another company that's kind of joined and doing this and doing that. Um, as far as sustainable fashion is concerned, it's much easier, I would say demonstrate that your product is has been made in a sustainable way okay uh, you know so for example um, a fair trade certified cotton okay there's, there's a whole accreditation system uh, there's, there's there's the GOTS the whole cotton uh, initiative from, from Germany um, what's much more difficult is accrediting social standards uh, you know, it's like uh, you, you can test the quality, you can test a few things and, and this, this shirt I'm wearing, you, what, you, what's a bit difficult even through a label is to say, can I, can I really be sure that uh, 
in that, in that whole supply chain that, that resulted in the shirt that, that the workers were not mistreated. Uh, and, 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 and there's the, the, the worry I have with, because ultimately that leads you to a kind of labelling system. And we have that already. I mean, there's loads of labels on garments now. It's almost like you need a degree in, in this. And uh, uh, fa factory certification leading to labels is by and large being done business to business. But you talk to, um, certainly if you talk to multi-stakeholder initiatives, like the Fair Labour Association, even Fairway, well, Fairway has come under pressure by its members to have a label on the, there's a, what the Fairway's position is, all that label is telling people is that 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 they're working hard at a process, and not it's not a guarantee that the working conditions behind those garments are absolutely brilliant. Because a lot of fairway members source from Bangladesh, for for, for example. Um, you haven't talked much about uh, gender and the fact oh, right. that these yeah. workers yeah, yeah. Are, are women. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, do of course it's a hypothetical question whether it would be have been a difference if it was mainly male workers working there. But I'm thinking about these women who perhaps sometimes not even by the trade unions yeah. are viewed upon as true workers, yeah. even though they are actually, you mentioned earlier, main breadwinners. Yeah. Um, yeah, a hypothetical question. Would they have got a greater support from, for example, unions, ILO, the government, etc., if they yeah. were men? Right. It's not a hypothetical question. In fact, uh, Spectrum, the, uh, the majority of workers who died in Spectrum were male. And there is a gender dimension to that, not just because they were male, but because uh, sweater production is largely male dominated. It's piecework, it's fairly physical, but I would argue no more physical than kind of operating a handloom. Uh, but it's where the money can be made. Um, so uh, the big gender dimension with Spectrum, and it will be around also with Rana, because uh, actually I haven't, haven't got the, I, I have got the, uh, not with me unfortunately, the gender breakdown of the victims. Um, but particularly those uh, male uh, victims who were married, we get into a whole other ball game about uh, what rights do the beneficiaries have? Because then uh, Muslim family law can kind of be applied to determine who shall get whatever pension has been, or whatever amount of compensation has been uh, determined. Um, now, uh, when this one was um, developed, it was developed largely under European gender equity <coughs> principles, right? So if you were a widow, you are gonna get full entitlement. Uh, but very soon there were local disputes because the families were, you know, and the, heads, the heads of that, largely male heads of the household was in a minute, you know? Uh, the, 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 there's, a, there's a considerable family here dependent on this in, in, in your taking all the money and, and it had happened that some, some of the widows then went off and remarried taking the money with them and uh, that's an issue um, on the other hand uh, we know that some of the widows uh, who received substantial checks probably were victims of uh, violence uh, to get that money up to get that money off them and then and, and one of the uh, features of the Primark scheme, because this became a major preoccupation of um, Javier Cercales, who was the CSR director, uh, or was then, um, is that he's really worried about the vulnerability of uh, female beneficiaries. Uh, and so he's trying to come up with a, 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 a means of distributing compensation that's much more in tune with Muslim family law but then an additional kind of initiative largely provided through women's NGOs to support widows, either with refugees uh, or, or, uh, or, or you know, financial training, and probably even additional amounts of money through the back door to kind of uh, address that. Uh, I just wanted yeah. to say that when uh, Madam said that gender issue, Bangladesh is actually a Muslim country 90 
uh, percent are, are Muslims. So, yeah. garment sector actually not only gave them um, living, but it's kind of opening the women to, to empowerment, women empowerment. So, I would like to request uh, when you're researching, I, I, I would like to request and you that you Western people please don't leave Bangladesh because now you have these issues. I know I am not defending my country. They have a lot of corruptions, mm. mismanagement, and yet it's opportunities for women in Bangladesh. 40 million women working in, in government sector. So I was reading um, an um, article that some Western people, like especially in Canada, they are not, uh, ne they are not uh, buying Bangladesh where they have made in Bangladesh, they are kind of not buying any clothes. So I was asking a question, is this the way you, you, uh, you behave? I mean, they have been, th these women have been working and they, they, you get such a fine clothes here in the West. Uh, Walmart provide you uh, nice clothes, but how much they get these women? They get like 35, uh, $35 per month. Mm. And now that this building collapsed, this is not their fault. Mm -hmm. This is not the women the, who are mm. working, the workers, mm -hmm. they are not fault. This is not their fault. So it will, it will be like a um, disaster for Bangladeshi women yeah. if Western companies go somewhere else. I know what they do. They go somewhere else when there is some problem. Yeah. That's yeah. what they do. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, a, my that's a very important point. And, and just on this accord, those companies that have signed up to it have pledged to uh, to a five-year plan. Okay, so it's not like they're going to kind of immediately pull out. Uh, some people might say five years is not enough; it needs to be much longer. And you'll have to wait and see what happens after five years. But I, I know there will probably be one or two other companies that are, have signed up to this. But maybe I'm thinking, let's start to. And a road, retreat a little, a little bit. It's not only, and I, it, I, I mean, agree with you. I mean, I'm not, only, I'm not only saying the companies, the people who buy clothes. If they're saying no, we're not gonna buy any Bangladeshi clothes. Mm -hmm. That is a disaster for yeah. women. But, but the thing is, yeah, I've been, I mean, I've been on Swedish television being asked this question several times about uh, what do we do because do we boycott H and M and do we boycott? And people come up to me and say, you should know, I never buy things from Bangladesh, you know. But and I always say, no, continue to buy because you have to. The, the, it's a disaster if the women lose their yeah. jobs. But on the other hand, when I the other day heard on the radio, they you know H and M are making five point seven billion, uh, you know, euro in profits. You know, shouldn't it have any repercussions for them that this happened? Uh, do you see what I mean? It's not. Yeah. I mean, my first gut reaction, seeing all the women in Bangladesh walking past my kitchen window, I know, you know, they shouldn't be be hurt, but. Someone has to be hurt. It has to hurt somewhere. And and where do you think it should hurt? Because because how do you get to be a GME? A <laughs> how do you yeah. get to them? Yeah. Do you see what I mean? We yeah. must we must see that where is the agent for hope? Where is the agent for change? First thing I would say is not every garment has Bangladesh on the label. Right? We haven't got a common European labeling system, and and I'm not sure if. You may have different information, but I don't see average customers like looking at labels on the back and looking for the country of origin. Oh, yeah, people oh, do. They do? Yes. Well, it's kind of not my... Well, I don't know who does, but it, it might be a certain segment of the market. Um, the, the, the kind of in the value retailers, the, uh, it's price. It's uh, people... Uh, you know, we are in an economic crisis, right? And people are, and, and this is one thing I suppose that is in your favour, that uh, cheaply produced goods are still, uh, you know, and, and it's, the, it's the Lidl's and the Aldi's and that that are suddenly the middle class is flocking to in the UK, I don't know what it's like here. Um, but, but there's this, uh, the, 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 the profits of these kind of companies that depend a lot on China and a lot on Bangladesh for, at least for the clothing part, uh, is still quite, quite buoyant. And the crazy thing about um, a company like Primark, uh, and it, it's a bit like what you're saying with even with H&M, they, they get a, a tremendous amount of negative press, but that doesn't affect their sales. So I don't see, you see, I don't see the marketplace, frankly, as being the, the fulcrum or the, 
the anvil where these changes are going to occur. I have very little faith. Uh, I said this yesterday. Um, I, I was at a fairway conference in, in Amsterdam. And uh, the moderator started the whole exercise off. And, and she said, right, I want you all to tell me where you buy your clothes from. Okay. And I put my hand up. I said, I'll start. I am exclusively Marks and Spencer. Now, I don't know if Marks and Spencer means anything to anybody in this room, yeah. but it's quite okay. It's quite a well-known brand in the UK. Marks and Spencer is also known for what's called Plan A, which is a complete business model founded on this notion of sustainability. Because there's no Plan B. That's the kind of slogan he used, right? So I said, I'm exclusively Marks and Spencer, but guess what? I'm not consciously buying Marks and Spencer for its sustainability program. I'm consciously buying Marks and Spencer because that company invested in a bus terminus at the far end of the store, and I walk through that store to get the bus home every night, and that's the only store I ever walk through because I'm too busy to go shopping anywhere else, and that's why I, that's why I end up buying Marks and Spencer stuff because I have no, you know. And at the point I was trying to make um, was that I just think in the area of fashion, unfortunately, there are too many factors that intrude. Uh, and, and sometimes in the, in the higher end of fashion, and you probably know this yourselves, folks, if you go into a shop, it's, oh, I've got to have that. That's a must-have. And then the second thing you think about is, okay, how much is it? And then maybe you might look at the label. And then you're kind of concerned about, well, are the, you know, are the labels giving me the right kind of information? And I, 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 so then you have to think, well, if that is your position, well, how do you see, and it's a question you're posing, where do you see kind of the, uh, the real changes occurring? And for me, and it's just kind of where, what my career has been and where, you know, who I've worked with and where, what I wanted, I, I'm, I can't be bothered with being the conscious consumer, frankly. Uh, I, I want to put my efforts into what I'm doing in, in Bangladesh is the country I want to focus on uh, around living wage and, and trying to um, you know do something about uh, but how, do you, how, how do you suggest? I mean, that's your yeah. because you're yeah, your well, profession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But so, so, what would you suggest for for uh, for people in yeah. Sweden? Yeah, good and question. You see, and also, you see, H and M has a special you know position for us yeah. because it's our our H and M. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then when we hear that they source most of the garments from Bangladesh, yeah. of course, it's become yeah. a, 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 an issue for lots of lots yeah. of us. Yeah. So, so what do? Yeah, we do? no, it's a very bad, no, you, absolutely. You, um, so, the, then the issue is if if you if you if you know you, look by all means be a questioning consumer. Don't I'm, I'm being a, I'm being a bit kind of facetious, right? But but of course you 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 you're, you become you you be be critical, ask questions in the stores. But there are other there are other fora in which you, you know the shareholder meetings. There's 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 questions you can ask of. Uh, of the company, you can write in, you can join organizations, you can join multi-stakeholder organizations and, and, and kind of push in, in various ways. But, but you know, you, you mentioned about kind of global, the, the big, and Katia, the, the bigger kind of world trade thing. I, I just wanted to, um, you know, one thing that's not, uh, not really uh, talked about is, and, and let's come back to this issue of compensation and some kind of sustainable um, thing. There is a piece of legislation that was passed in 2006 called the Labour Welfare Foundation Act, which sets up in Bangladesh um, provisions for just such uh, disasters and for taking care of, uh, of uh, victims. The problem is there's no money in the fund. It was supposed to be funded out of employer profits. There's one thing that H&M, for example, you could, you could demand of H&M and, and they say this, that they expect through their code of conduct that, their, that their, the countries that they supply from should apply the law and that their suppliers should follow the law. And no supplier, to my knowledge, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, has honoured this legislation, <coughs> excuse me, and is, is paying 5% of their profits into a fund. It's it, not happening. But was that Mohammed Yunus' idea? He no, that's that's idea. that's the other. That's another one. Yeah, it's kind of it. the bottom one. I'm going to come to. The other the other way forward. So that's one thing, right? That's one way forward. Um, the other thing is 
there needs to be a proper employer's liability insurance where um, employers are paying um, a premium into a fund that will cover such eventualities like this. The third one, which is a bit more radical, uh, but it's where we, we tackle the corporate greed uh, position. You know, we, we try and um, we, we, uh, we impose a tax and it, would, it just can be small. Mohammed Yunus is calling for five cents. And he's, by the way, he, 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 uh, it's, a living, it's his living wage kind of proposal. And uh, what he's saying is that uh, if they did that, then a company would be entitled to put on, on a garment a happy worker label. Not sure about happy worker label, but anyway. <laughs> uh, but it kind of something along those lines, you know. He said. Um, but think about it. If, if, and this is the problem that, that you know, take any factory, a good number of brands have probably passed through it some point and so it becomes a much more collective fluid situation in which everybody is responsible so if every brand was paying for every garment that it, um, that it was sourcing from please, one tacker into a fund now the, the big question is and you mentioned corruption we need oversight of a fund like that I mean it could go into a government fund and because you don't have a social welfare system in Bangladesh and you badly need one and that would be the basis for it. Uh, if you were to use it for wages, then there's the issue of um, suddenly the government becomes the paymaster in, in the private money, and that's kind of difficult. You'd, you'd have to kind of... But of course, the one tacker could go into the BGMEA, and then you could have a sectoral bargaining fund. But you're already we'll pulling your face. Close down BGMA. Yeah, do yeah, like yeah. You're already pulling your face because you know what the BGMA yeah. is like. So, but, 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 yeah. Ask, yeah. Another question. Yeah. Uh, and that since we have to run up soon. Yeah. Is how do we? Uh, or some people say that this. You have to imagine all these factories in Bangladesh. Uh, for you who haven't been there, it's it's not. It's a it's a massive country. It's lots of people. It's a lot of, of garment factories. And, and as you say, there's a lot of suppliers passing through for two months, for three months, for six years, and yeah. so on. Yeah. But uh, I've heard that some suppliers are buy, building their own factories, and H&M have actually considered doing this in Bangladesh, to build your own factories. You get the, the permit, you, you build it, you take responsibility for the, the, the cement, and the concrete is good, mm -hmm. that there are enough uh, constructive support, yeah. that you have engineers that you get in there if they're not available and then you pay living wages so what's your comment to that would that work great um, but uh, I think uh, just building the factory is not enough uh, it's a precondition for a living wage being paid uh, in the sense that if uh, if say H&M built and owned its own factories or was in joint venture with yeah. their own factories or in a joint venture with a with a Bangladeshi yeah. entrepreneur yeah. Yeah. Um, but was just making H&M product yeah but that's because I think Timberlake not Timberlake that's Timberland. Not Timberland. Timberland. <laughs> Timberland is doing yeah. that that they have their own factories they take full responsibility yeah. they employ people yeah. they own the factories yeah. Yeah. Uh, but H&M are all the time when this question comes up they all the time sort of say that that's too my well, it, it's just that it's just that if you look, I I, I do I, I know that H and M is one of the biggest sources from uh, Bangladesh, so goodness knows how many factories they they've got. So, you know, that's then the issue. Then is uh, how how many new factories would it have to build? And, and then we're back to a situation that we used to have, where actually branded manufacturers owned their own factories back here in Sweden, back in the UK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's another kind of economy, isn't yeah. it? It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, but is that bad? Because this, no. you know, the comp uh, uh, No, I but I mean, the the thing is, make it a joint venture. You know, uh, you, uh, engage engage with the Bangladesh uh, industry and the workers uh, in a in a in a proper way. I mean, that's a precondition. But what I would say is that uh, uh, the, there are examples of um, you know buyer owned factories. That aren't necessarily any better than uh, South the other Korea ones. are doing that a lot, aren't they? Um, I, I I don't know. I don't know. I, I know if there's a there's a UK. But I mean, for H and M, if you see yeah. it from the H and M's point yeah. of view, would be that you suddenly could answer questions because you know maybe they don't want to answer questions, but suddenly you could be in a position where you could answer exactly how much do we pay people, what's the yeah. compensation if anything happens, we have 
daycare centers, their Absolutely. health insurance is blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, I mean, they would have a lot of sort of goodwill to gain. Yeah. It would be my take on it. But, uh, no, uh, no I, think, I think that's a very good idea. The, 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 and, and what it gets around is, uh, my understanding is H&M went to one of the suppliers once and said, we're ready to pay a living wage. And the supplier said, no way, absolutely no way, you will completely destabilize industrial relations in this neighborhood. But that's what, that's what my, my friends who are working yeah. with this closely uh, at Swedewatch are saying, yeah. that, 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 they would, that, that the BGMA are putting the lid on, they're not interested in that. So actually what you yeah. pointed out here somewhere yeah. was that Patagonia or whatever, yeah. actually do offer that they has, there has been meetings with BGMA from the uh, suppliers and saying, look, why don't we increase wages with 30% or 40%. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they're not interested, no. and they can't do it alone. No. That's what they say. Yeah. But I, I don't know what's true in this, or what's just you know uh, strategies to avoid. It's strategies to avoid. I think. Yeah, it's a lot of strategies. Yeah. 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 Just a few remarks. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. We have some uh, buyer-owned industries, uh, but uh, those are not governments. Uh, actually, those are uh, sports were like Nike. Okay. Uh, like Young One, it's a very yeah. big company from uh, yeah, South could, Korea. Yeah. So, but the problem is most of them are in EPZ, export, yes. export processing zone. Yeah. And they don't allow in the in the EPZ area. We have different law, mm -hmm. and the trade unions are not allowed. No. So the thing is that if the buyer started uh, to set up their uh, factories inside the EPZ, that will be another problem because they don't allow trade unions. Yeah. So uh, be, uh, while suggesting this one, yeah. please uh, make sure that. Uh, they uh, allow the trade unions uh, to, to run the sure. trade unions as well. Sure. And this is also important. Yeah, that, uh, because there's a tradition in Bangladesh of having domestically owned industry. And it's only the export processing zones where you have, uh, you know, uh, foreign owned uh, companies. I just m must point out, out a sad thing for those of you who are not familiar with Bangladesh. That trade unions are not exactly what trade unions are in Europe. That's a sad story as well. Yeah, yeah. All other kind of worms. What? All other kind of worms. I yeah. just want to finish on one more slide. If it, um, you may have, sorry, you may have one or two other things to say. This is the BGMA headquarters in uh, in um, Dhaka, okay. And in April last year, the high uh, sorry, the high court ordered its demolition. Why? Because it had been illegally built on a lake, <laughs> right? And of course, the BGMA had been BGMA have managed to resist and appealed and uh, it's kind of still there. But uh, that just gives you a fl flavour of uh, <coughs> how things are uh, a bit in the country. Okay, I better, I better stop. Uh, stop uh. Do you want to? We have to stop here. Uh, <coughs> thank you so much, the two of you, for a very uh, interesting uh, afternoon here. And I hope that uh, we are not going away from this room unaffected by what you have said. And we hope to, to, to learn more. And um, we will always be ready to publish things on the, the SASNET uh, webpage and, and uh, in the newsletter. Yeah. Speaking of publications, one quick book. I brought a couple of, of just a few copies left of the uh, the book that's available for a uh, hundred set, um, and it, it it gives you. I think the, if you want to understand the whole compensation debate at the moment and where it might go, I think quite apart from the inside story of some of this, these things, it might, you might find it uh, uh, useful. And, and I think you've got your book to plug as well, haven't you? No, I have other few. Yeah. So this is my book. You can find it at Academy of Or. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much.